being a professor is that I never stop being a student. Now, I've been studying bilingualism for a while, and I've come across some interesting statistics. 7,000 languages in the world, more than 50% of the world is bilingual, 20% of the US is bilingual. Now, I think we can be reasonably sure about the 7,000 world languages, but how do we know about the 50% and the 20%? Well, the fact that I've seen these statistics repeated over and over again made me think of what Shakespeare wrote. The lady doth protest too much, methinks, and that maybe there is something further to investigate. So I read a lot of excellent research on bilingualism, and I explored the different types that have been, that have been identified. For example, diglossia, which is a type where one language is used in one context and another language in another context, such as using one language at home, another language at school or work. And I've come across two features that, in general terms, may be said to characterize the bilingual individual. He or she learns two languages at home or at school or in any combination of those environments. And this language learning enables the bilingual to communicate in those languages. Well, communication is a broad term. And as I continued my research, I became interested in the inevitable contact that arises between languages during communication, like the N in parentheses in mayonnaise. Hmm. So, you know, in the past, it was thought that a lot less of this contact occurred because the bilingual individual processed each language separately during communication. But more recent psychological research has shown that when communicating, whether among other individuals or with oneself, while reading, thinking, or even dreaming, the bilingual individual processes all learned languages all the time. The inevitable contact that occurs in the brain between languages produces interferences. Like the time my nine-year-old son, who's being brought up bilingual, said London ojo instead of London eye, as we were hovering above the Thames in this big glass egg, and I took this selfie. So <laughs> interferences don't just interest me as a researcher, but also as a parent. Because any time you have anything that involves contact in the brain in a nine-year-old, it's going to be really important. So I expanded my research and started to look for cases, for examples of modern interferences. And I asked myself, if in the case of my son, my wife and I try to correct his interferences in order to improve communication, what would happen if such interferences were left to develop on their own? Well, one example is the South American country of Paraguay, where a colonial tradition of bilingualism evolved on encomiendas, which at times relied on forced Guarani labor, and on Jesuit reducciones, or missions, where the Guarani language was given written form for the first time. Contact between Guarani and Spanish continues to occur in modern Paraguay, among a population that, to a large extent, still learns the two languages as they have since colonial times, with Guarani being learned at home and uh, Spanish being used in, uh, learned in conjunction with school or work, although today Guarani and Spanish are two languages that enjoy equal prestige. You know, the funny thing about colonial Paraguay is that it really wasn't a colony, but more of a frontier, where the Spanish settlers were always in the minority, and where Guarani was never replaced by Spanish. Centuries of linguistic contact between Guarani and Spanish have produced so many interferences that many linguists consider modern Paraguayan Spanish to be a new language called Guaraniol or Jopara. And on the screen next to me, we see an example of that, of a Guarani personal pronoun, pe, fused onto the end of a Spanish phrase that means I go to night school, that has also been modified by phonetic tendencies from Guarani. As a researcher interested in the Iberian Peninsula, I began to think of the similarity between the history of Paraguay and the history of a remote colony in northern Spain, the Roman colony in Cantabria, which was a little bigger than modern Cantabria, but more or less corresponds to the red splotch on the bottom map. In the east, center, and the west of the Iberian Peninsula was where the most intense Romanization occurred and where indigenous languages were replaced by Spanish. But Cantabria was a remote colony where the Roman contingent was always small, 
which allowed the indigenous Cantabrian language to survive and come into contact with spoken Latin. Modern Cantabria is still somewhat of a remote colony. It's an area of about some 5,200 square kilometers or about 2,000 square miles with a population of less than 600,000, many of whom live in the coastal city of Santander, which is the capital. Inland Cantabria, which is known as the one, most, one of the most greenest parts of Spain, is largely rural and agricultural. And so while there's great transportation to the major places in Cantabria, in inland Cantabria, the best way to travel is by foot or by bike. So I bought a bike, and I began to bike down the back roads of Cantabria looking for traces of bilingualism from late, antiqu from late antiquity. But I didn't find any Roman ruins as I would in the south of the peninsula. But I did find a beautiful valley called Balderadible, which is located in the south of Cantabria, where the VAL is on the map in the lower left, and which is about some 300 square kilometers, about 115 square miles, through which the Ebro River makes its winding course. It's a very fertile valley. There are some picturesque villages and some wonderful people to meet and some fascinating Romanesque churches that you can get to know intimately because many times you are the only one there. Now in Balderadible, I also found seven caves, which may have been in use since prehistoric times, since Balderadible is only about 100 kilometers or some 60 miles south of Altamira Cave, which is one of the most pre important prehistoric caves in the world. Now these caves are different sizes. The smallest on the upper left kind of also measures some 30 square kilometer, uh, meters or 320 square feet. The largest on the bottom, lower left, lower right, have two floors. But they're all carved into the soft sandstone rock as the chisel marks reveal in each case. Now here's some things I didn't know before I went to the caves. One, how much bike saddlebags weigh when they're loaded with photographic equipment? Two, that a bike with those saddlebags cannot be ridden up a mountain. And that three, at some point in human history, someone had put metal doors on five of the seven caves and had distributed the keys to local villagers. So what do we know about the caves? <laughs> what do we know about the caves? Well, we know that they're located in proximity to the Ebro River and what may be called a nucleus. And there's an inscription in one of the caves that may reveal when the rest of the caves were cut into their present form. Now, while the end of this inscription is a little difficult to read, and here I am during the filming of a Spanish television document documentary discussing with the sound guy and the director the reading of the last three letters of, of the inscription, it's obvious that the inscription concerns the dedication of the cave to a Christian saint during a year revealed after the a, which is on the far upper left, which is the last letter in ERA, which is ERA, which refers to the Roman consular era, which is used in medieval Iberian Latin inscriptions to indicate dates, which in this case is the year 687 AD. In each of the cave churches, we also see interior carved, cut spaces that reveal they were made to be churches, as here in Santa Maria de Valverde which has gone so, undergone some repairs. For example, we see that a roof has been added. This is the bottom of the roof over the top of the cave in order to prevent further deterioration through the rock. But the chisel marks, and we see those here in the upper right, reveal the work that was done centuries ago. In each of the cave churches, we see a nave cut to the east that ends in an apse in which an altar stood or still stands in this case. Now in Santa Maria de Valverde, at another point, another nave was cut to be in a north-south direction to make space for greater numbers of worshipers who still today, who can today sit at these benches. A necropolis, or city of the dead, where burials occurred, is cut into the top and around each of the cave churches, which attests to the fact that they were considered to be sacred spaces. And I also noticed that in each of the cave churches, Dividing the apse from the nave, there's an arch, but that arch is not semicircular in shape, but horseshoe form. Now, I knew of some horseshoe-shaped, Mozarabic and Islamic horseshoe-shaped arches from the 10th century in Spain. But I had no idea if the horseshoe arches in the cave churches had anything to do with over there from that period, because I had no idea how to talk 
about arches that were cut into stone rather than being made out of cut stones. My first attempt is a little visible in the upper right in the picture of the horseshoe arch from Santa Maria de Valverde, in which I've inserted in the lower right something that reveals that at the time my belief as an avid follower of CSI that by inserting a measuring device I could later determine scale at home. Okay, that didn't work. And so I went back to the University of Tennessee and I spoke with some colleagues in architecture and they suggested I use a laser transit, which I had only seen used before on the highway by surveyors. So I wrote a grant proposal and I actually could have purchased a laser transit, but I wasn't going to put it back on the bike. So I decided it was much better to collaborate with a team of surveyors from the University of Cantabria. And we wanted to be the first to take the laser transit into the cave churches. But before we could, we had to get the key to the first one from Aurea Marasca, who takes care of the cave church of Campo de Ebro, who you see here in the picture talking to Borja, one of the surveyors, and he is assuring her that this laser transit will do no damage to the in interior of the cave, of the cave, which, uh, cave church, which had also been the place where she went to elementary school in the 1940s. So we spent two weeks surveying the interiors. We ended up doing all the arches and the rest of the interiors. And in another two weeks to process the results. And there I am at the University of Cantabria, sitting beside Borja, waiting for his computer to finish the, pro the results after surveying the interiors. And I finally did see something that shed some light on the bilingual culture I was trying to study. Because the drawings of the arches made possible with the laser transit, here placed over photos of arches, allowed me to see that the horseshoe arches in the cave churches maintain the same proportions as horseshoe arches in the six remaining Visigothic masonry churches in the north of the Iberian Peninsula. Horseshoe arches made in the Visigothic style are shorter and narrower than horseshoe arches made in the Mozarabic Islamic style, and like this one from central Cab Cantabria, which I measured too, as long as I was there. And this difference is important because it allows us to link the horseshoe arches in the Visigothic masonry churches and to the horseshoe arches in the cave churches, all of which were made during the 7th century, when the cave churches were the center of a, the spiritual center of a culture that, where languages came into contact because of bilingualism. And we know it was a bilingual culture because the inscription I mentioned earlier is one of only many inscriptions that have been found and that continue to be found inside the cave churches and in the surrounding area. Many of these inscriptions are found on stone tablets that were once used as funerary markers but that have been discovered as components of buildings or walls. Now these tablets are not only interesting linguistically but also sociologically. For example, this one on the screen which reveals a very poignant moment that occurred between a mother and her son nearly 2,000 years ago. Now for me, the most, the most interesting aspect of these inscriptions, like the giant one behind me on the tablet, is that they contain interferences that were produced by contact between the indigenous Cantabrian language and spoken Latin. And as I transcribed and analyzed the interferences, the interferences started to look like Castilian or Spanish, and not surrounding dialects such as Leonese and Aragonese. We see examples here of, that, of those pre-Castilian interferences that involve morphology and phonology, including consonants and vowels that continue to characterize Spanish today. Now, I say pre-Castilian because there wasn't any Castile during the 7th and 8th centuries when the cave churches were active spiritual centers. Castile is a name that is first recorded around the year 100 when it refers to a region on the northern fringe of the Iberian central Meseta, more or less the line on the map below Amaya, where castros, such as those near the southern Cantabrian fortress of Peña Amaya, and the cave churches themselves, as is the case here in Presilla, were among the many strategically located structures that came to be known as castillos, or castles as Castile became a county and then a kingdom in the 10th and 11th centuries. Well before that time, the cave churches were the home to a religious sect that followed the practices of a 6th century hermit named Mian, or Emilian, who was later named a saint and who, like St. James, became one of the most important symbols of Christian Castile during the reconquest of Islamic Spain. 
Followers of Mion cut living spaces in and near the place where he spent the last 30 years of his life, which may well have been this cell cut into the second floor of Arulola's cave church. After Mion's death, his followers continued his practices and received pilgrims on, through the early Middle Ages. Like the Jesuit missions of Paraguay, the cave churches of Valredible served as a focal point for the Christianization of Cantabria, in turn fomenting bilingualism and spreading Proto-Castilian, which had been created through language contact. Now, my research in, to the genesis, uh, concerning the genesis of the Spanish language as a result of prolonged bilingualism in southern Cantabria has drawn uh, attention in the academic world and in the Spanish media, where some have called it La Guerra del Castellano, or the War over Castilian, in reference to the, at times, charged debate that continues to evolve. But for me, the most fascinating aspect of this debate is that it's not only transcontinental, it's transdisciplinary and involves all the disciplines I've mentioned today. Architecture, archaeology, linguistics, sociology, psychology, medieval hispanism, history. You know, that's what I really meant at the beginning of this talk, that I love being a professor today because transdisciplinarity is an integral component of today's university. And I'm sure that transdisciplinarity will be an integral component of tomorrow's university as well. Thank you very much.